Hello and welcome to this month's Mick the Cat's Mersey Mag Beat. Talking to Colin Schofield this month, a very good friend of mine, fantastic drummer. First saw you with uh, Fancy Dancer all them years ago with Val and Terry. Yeah. So uh, why did you choose the drums, Colin? Right, um, well the drums chose me uh, in the sense that uh, all my friends at school played guitars and um, sang. So they needed a drummer. With my eldest brother playing the drums, uh, they all looked at me and said, well, Scoey, you won't have to play the drums. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah, really. And what age was this? I was about 14 then. 14? Yeah. And, uh, w you know, who were your influences at the time? Who were you listening to? Well, it's funny, really, because I wasn't really into music as such. Um, it was just that because my friends got guitars and things, that sort of made me interested. And as I say, I fell in the drum seat um, through force of them. And um, I suppose it was the Rolling Stones, the Who, that yeah. type of thing. Did you have a favourite drummer at the time? Uh, well, it'd have to have been Keith Moon. <laughs> um, you know, I can't play like him, but a great player. and uh, Showman, wasn't Showman, he? yeah, showmanship. That's the thing. An entertainer as much as any, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Brilliant drummer as well, yeah, though. Yeah. And complete lunatic. Yeah. And where was your first gig? Do you remember that? First gig was... Um, I think it was a, a, a club, a social club down the end of the road where we lived, which is a Wavy Tree uh, cricket club, funnily enough, and uh, we played there, there's a few neighbours in there, a bit nervy, but that was, I think, our first gig, yeah. Great stuff, and uh, was there as nervous as this? Um, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, who are you playing with now, Carl? I'm playing with uh, two bands at the moment, one's a, a new band called uh, the Scony Band, and it's John Euston on guitar, who used to be with uh, the Bingo Brothers fame, a uh, local duo from years ago, with um, Tony Roberts, who used to s sing, and uh, he went under the name also of Private Jack. I used to love their version of The Russians Are Coming. Oh yeah, Everyone The Russians, was, yeah. And Tony's guitar in that, you know, fantastic, what a player. Yeah. Scotty, Scotty was on, on the guitar. Sorry, getting mixed yeah. up, yeah. Yeah. But uh, absolutely fantastic. I mean, he just used to blow you away with his geek, didn't he? He yeah. put so much into it. It also is, uh, and his voice is very like sort of Tom Waits and the buddy, can you spare me a dime? He used to do, you know, banging his foot on the floor. Because I saw Tony doing that, and did he get that off, uh, did he get that off Scotty then? No, no, Scotty, Scotty was the guitarist with the... No, I know that, but did he get the buddy, can you spare a dime off uh, Scotty? Because I, I used to see Tony singing that as well. Yeah, oh yeah, that, that's what I say, that was Tony who sang it, that ah, his voice was good for that. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. And uh, what kit are you using now? I'm using um, a combination, It's a, the main kit is a Pearly LX, with a 20 inch bass drum, 12 by 6 snare drum, which is called a Soprano. And I've got a, my first tom is a 10 inch tom, and I use a 12 inch tom from a floor tom. No, I remember you always used to have small kits. I remember your white yeah. sonar kit. Oh, yeah, lovely kit. Beautiful, that. absolutely yeah. tremendous sound. That. Yeah. You looked at it and you thought, how did the sound come out of that? Because it was so small. Yeah, well, it was, um, that was a lovely little kit. I'm sorry I sold that. That was a cracking little kit. 18-inch bass drum with a 8, 10, 12, 16 toms. Beautiful, absolutely yeah. loved it. Now, you went on, obviously, to develop your own drum kits, didn't you? And you made... Kobe kits, which are, you know, mm. tell us something about that. Mate. Electronic drum kits. Okay, well, in the um, early 80s, I mean, the technology within the industry was um, starting with, like, drum machines. So a lot of drummers, um, I think, was fearful of the technology. Uh, these machines taking over, and time is money in the studios. And um, I didn't really like the idea of machines taking our jobs, in a sense. And I think, at the end of the day, we're human beings. But if we could use the latest technology and play these sounds live from a conventional format, then you still retain the live element and the dynamic looks of the drummer in the band. That's the thing that people miss, isn't it, when they're using backing tape? There's nothing like having that drummer yeah, on the a stage. Bit. Not only does it give the sound out, it's, it's so physical playing the drums because you're using both yeah. arms, both feet. Mm. Yeah, well, this is the thing, Mick, what I've found. I mean, obviously, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of drummers fell out of work. Uh, and the uh, guitarists and keyboard colleagues, if you like, went out playing midweek gigs, you know, uh, as together. Tours. 
as duos more money or single acts you know <laughs> or trios even without yeah. the drummer and uh, using backing tapes and drum machines and as good as it sounded it's it it just didn't look right it's not the same is it as live drums no and i think i think what happened then as well i think um, bands supposedly duos and three piece without a drummer were being judged on the equipment they had as in lighting rigs pa system where, where like when you were in a band you didn't really have all that it was a no, basic 100 PA. 100 pa 100 yeah. pa yeah you could have the singer yeah, you know, so the drum sounds were great because they were electronically generated through the backing tracks. But uh, to look at, it just wasn't visually dynamic. And what a drummer had is, as you say, you know, these swinging arms around, a bit of sweat and blood, you know. Yeah, oh, very much so. That's what people want, that's what they're paying for. So you... Of course, some purists have knocked the use of uh, electronic drums, like saying they're not real. What's your view on that, Carl? Yeah, well... They aren't real um, in the sense that, like, uh, drum sounds wise. I mean, I got I, I was interested in the sound of the kit at the time, which was totally analog synthesized sound. And uh, what was happening with the eurythmics at the time, Dave Stewart and uh, Barbara Gaskin also was um, it was a great sound, a magical sound. And for what we were doing with the, with the original band at the time, with the Gale Singer, it suited us perfectly. Was that Val? That was Val, yes. I, so I was at that gig at the World Court where you, it was all MIDI, wasn't it? You, you're opening number. It was just drums, am I remembering that right? Was this the drums over the Maisie gig? No, no, I, th I think, wasn't it the f you were on the court with Phil Jones? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that was, that'd be about ooh, 10 years ago, I think. More than Possibly that, even it? more, yeah, 14 <laughs> years ago. Yeah, yeah um, that. that was using the top end Simmons SDX system. It, was, it wasn't midi up, it was actually a sample-based uh, electronic drum kit with zone positioning on the drum pad so it could detect where about you did the pad and what sound had to be output. Cause you could assign up to nine samples on the drum head and by varying the position and the dynamic, you could get a different timbre of the sound. But the whole band were using it, weren't they? The, um, I seem to recall. No, uh, they were playing it, tricks. No, uh, what I was playing was uh, on the cymbal pads. I had when I hit the cymbal pad, uh, I triggered the loop, which was sampled, and um, I had it sort of so it would loop every four bars. So every four bars, as I was playing, I had to hit it. Uh, it was also a safety net as well because if you just hit a, a pad and let it play from start to end, then you know, if someone else goes out in the band, then you can't stop it. You may be in time, but someone else may have gone out. So what I done with that, with that um, sample at the time, I assigned it to a symbol because the symbols you could stop it. So if it was drifting too far, I could actually still be playing. So it's like a real time. And thing. stop it for say four bars, and then hopefully it come back in time um, with the rest of the band. No one else would really notice. You know, it, it, obviously you could hear that little bit of a drop there, but the way I'd done it was to sort of make it fit in as if it was meant. And uh, was that Andy Wilson, wasn't it? Keyboard, was no, he? No, Andy wasn't on keyboards. No, it was um, it was Chris Loyal, uh, known as Piggy. Right. And uh, he is a bit of a tech, a bit of a tech head. He's good with all the keyboards side of things and MIDI. Did you write that stuff yourself? Was it original stuff? I know you did do odd original stuffs. With, with Val, yes. Uh, I co-writed some of the material with Val. Yeah. on guitar um, and Andy Wilson would come in on keyboards and he'd put his bit and his arrangements and so forth and his footprints his footprints all on over it, yeah. it. <laughs> all over it yeah yeah and uh, have you done any other jobs yourself I know you're working uh, you're working with Andy's drum clinic now aren't you I'm working at Andy's drum clinic yeah. now yeah uh, mainly because um, through my knowledge of electronics I think and the, the drum um, systems I've used along the way. I think um, Andy have realised he's needed someone in the shop because Andy's not really into the technical side of things and none of the, the guys who work in the shop are. And uh, they needed someone there to look after that side of things. So. And have you worked yourself otherwise? I, I've only ever known you as a drummer. Yeah. Uh, are you uh, working yourself otherwise? Ever? Uh, work for myself. No, I know. I know you built yeah, Kobe drums, yeah. and that was an enterprise you did yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know, ever been 
A milkman? Oh yeah, I mean, well in the early It'd be days... It'd funny if you were a milkman, wouldn't it? <laughs> well in the early days of um, when the touch began, I was working in um, a factory, yeah. fruit juice factory, Britvic, the right. old Minster one on um, Wellington Road. I love the job. No, it no, it, it keeps you grounded in a way, doesn't it? Having a, mm. I know people call it the real world. Mm. But there's nothing unreal about being, working in a pub, but mm. um, the real world job does give you a different perspective, doesn't it? Of, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, you know mixing with other people. I mean, the 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 um, uh, as I say, I was, I was totally immersed in music as well at the time, and working in the factory. I mean, luckily enough, everyone was it got on great. Even the foreman and the uh, the bosses and things. You know. All right, Colin. I I ask this just to know what has uh, influenced you, and so other people can listen. We want eight songs off you. Eight it's, songs, right? Um, we're gonna do a list, so don't worry. You don't have to give us to it right now. Yeah. But just briefly, what do you think about the music scene at present? Uh, not much. <laughs> I mean, the way the industry has gone has gone again now. I mean, we had obviously karaoke coming in which I think has damaged the actual circuit itself because everyone now thinks they can sing if you like and it's a form of cheap entertainment and um, a lot of bands are finding it difficult now to to play these places. But no one um, plays an instrument anymore do they? They feel as though they don't need an instrument, they just need to queue up for X Factor. Yeah, yeah, well I and don't agree it. with all that, I, I, think it, I think it's wrong. Again it's a cheap form of entertainment. We've always had it. We had opportunity knocks, didn't we? Oh yeah. And we had whatever we had back then. Always mm. been talent shows. And if you remember in the social clubs, we used to have they used to have a letter, didn't they, in an envelope, and so it was M, and you'd have to sing all the songs beginning with M, and someone right. would win it, and they'd have a rollover. So yeah, there's always yeah, been yeah. that kind of yeah, yeah, people yeah. getting up. It's never been any different, but now it's just gone to ridiculous levels, hasn't it? It has, um, with everything really. I mean. Um, I mean, I chose the electronic drum route mainly for that reason, you know. Uh, I still play acoustic drums, um, but I, I combine the two so I get the best of both worlds. I'm in two bands, uh, one the Scotty band being more like a rocky band, and the other one being a cabaret type rock band where, um, where we play around Cheshire. So you mentioned the Scotty band you're playing with. Yeah. Uh, what's the other band you're working with? Uh, the other band is like a cabaret rock band. We do mainly pubs and now and then we do the odd club. And, Those uh, that are left. Yes, yeah. Um, and the off, the you know, private function like birthdays, weddings, and so funerals. Forth. I'm not doing more funerals uh, or anything lately. We haven't done one of those as such yet. No, just, maybe that's yeah. just maybe a few months. But uh, the other the other <laughs> band is called Reload, yeah. and uh, we play mainly around Cheshire. Classic um, cabaret rock band. Yeah, yeah. We do, I mean, I say. The way the industry's gone and the events of karaoke now, I mean, a lot of gigs have dropped off, so gigs are very far and few between now. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I tried to sort of fill the gaps in with the second band and um, do something a bit more local on the Whittle and Liverpool with the Scotty band. And he's, the way he is, he's very organic anyway. Is he still the same? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's very, uh, very organic, yes. Good stuff. And uh, very good guitarist, John. Very loud. I mean, uh, this is this is the beauty of having the electronics because I use um, what's called the acoustic drum triggers on my kit to reinforce the sound of the drums because no matter how big the kit is and how hard you're hitting it, you can only move so much air within them cylinders. So uh, it's when you're playing with the likes of John, Scotty, Euston, then uh, you really need to have a bit more. Up to God. 11. Yes, yeah, and beyond. And what, what happens is once you start putting microphones on a drum kit, it's the time to get the drum sound, and um, you don't. We don't have a mixing man out front, and you know, it's just people don't want to hear you hitting drums all the time. So by putting these acoustic drum triggers on the drums, you can assign the sounds you want to trigger, like a bass drum and snare drum, and you plug that into a, a module with them sounds on, and um, you just put them through a PA system. So you've got consistent sound, nice after night, and that gives you that as if the kit is mic'd up, with, without the hassle. Sounds good to me. Mm. Uh, thanks for that. No problem. And uh, next month, I think we're going to be interviewing Roger Morris, and I'm going to be looking forward to that as well. Roger from uh, The Real Thing. See you then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.